Uh, welcome today. My name is Julie Henderson, and I'm the Vice President of Philanthropy for East Bay SBCA. Uh, we appreciate you joining us this afternoon for our 2024 Lunch and Learn informational series. Today, we are incredibly excited to highlight the veter veterinary profession and the challenges nonprofits face in staffing clinics. Uh, but first, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce East Bay SBCA, uh, East Bay SBCA's President and CEO, Allison Lindquist, to start, to start today's program. Allison, kick it to you. I just want to welcome everyone today. This is going to be a great program. We get lots of questions about what's going on in the veterinary field and, you know, how we are able to continue to provide these great services to people and pets. So I am looking forward to hearing questions from all of you folks today and want to introduce Kristen Beitzel. She is the pro on all of this and will be sharing with us lots of great insight. Thanks, Allison. Yes, and it's now my honor to introduce East Bay SBCA's Vice President of Medical Services, Kristen Beitzel. Kristen has been in veterinary practice since 2005, holding various roles across multiple states in both private and corporate settings. She actively participates in the Veterinary Hospital Managers Association and currently sits on the Industry Advisory Panel. Kristen holds multiple degrees and certifications, including MBAs in Leadership and Change Management and Human Resources. She's certified as a veterinary practice manager, registered veterinary technician, elite fear-free professional, and is currently enrolled in the Human Animal Bond Certification Program. Kristen is also committed to animal welfare, particularly advocating for service dogs, and she loves black lab tours. It's my honor to call her my colleague, and we are incredibly grateful to have her as a leading member of our East Bay SBC, SBCA team. Kristen will run us through a 15 to 20 minute presentation, after which time she and Allison will answer questions. If you have questions, we encourage you to type them using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We will get to as many as we can within our time frame after the presentation ends. Kristen, take it away. All right, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us as we discuss the veterinary landscape and how East Bay SPCA is working to acquire and retain veterinary professionals. Um, I wanted to thank oops, I wanted to thank Julie for that wonderful introduction. Again, my name is Kristen Beitzel, and I am honored to be a member of the team here, especially as we celebrate our 150th anniversary. Some of the trends that we're seeing in the industry that's affecting the veterinary shortage that I want to go over today is the corporate takeover, um, exit of veterinarians from the field, as well as the supply and demand challenges. So firstly, I want to discuss corporate takeover. So individuals have changed the way that they see animals within their household. Previously, we had pets as basic companions, and sometimes they were tools that we used to help do the work that we needed. Now, generations are shifting to see pets as members of the family and even their kids. So those individuals are spending more money on their pets, including vet care, nutrition, enrichment, behavior, the whole encompassing well-being of their animals. Corporations saw that as a great opportunity to expand their portfolio and increase revenues that they're bringing in. So what they started to do is acquire veterinary practices. Some of these corporations, many people are familiar with. You'll see them across the board, such as VCA, Banfield, one of our local ones, Sage. Um, so they're all branded similarly. Then we have corporations and private equity that are acquiring practices and consolidating them that aren't changing their outward branding. So to the regular consumer, they think they're going to a privately owned practice supporting their local community. In reality, they're working with a corporately owned practice. Right now, we're seeing about 75% of specialty and emergency clinics actually being owned by corporations and about 40% of general practices being owned by corporations. So now these corporations have entered the field and they want to get a return of, us, return of investment and keep their stakeholders happy. So how do they do that? They increase prices. Now these prices have dramatically increased over the last 30 years from 
doubling to like 150% more than what it used to be. So um, clients are then acknowledging that there are challenges with being able to afford veterinary care and see what they can do within their um, budget. Now, because corporates are focused mainly on revenue, unlike privately owned practices who mainly had a mantra of practice good medicine and the revenue follows. Because you're building trust with clients, you're only recommending what's appropriate, you're looking at lifestyle and tailoring specifics, these corporations are then looking at kind of package-based medicine. Some of them are actually bringing coaches in to work with their veterinarians to um, customize treatment plans that are specific to the benchmarks that they want to meet versus what the actual problem is the client is coming in for. So that can build a little bit of distrust between the community and the clients with the veterinary profession. Then we have an exit of veterinarians from the field altogether. So COVID was the perfect storm when it came to individuals reevaluating what they wanted to do. There were many veterinarians that were either on the cusp of retirement or considering selling um, to leave, creating a exit strategy long-term, but they said, this is too much. There's too much going on in the field. I'm not able to practice the way I want to, and I'm gonna leave. So what that did is it fast-tracked the shortage of veterinarians. Now what we're looking at with studies showing that by the year 2030, there's gonna be 41,000 veterinarians needed that we don't have. And that's estimated that approximately 75 million pets in the United States are gonna go without accessible veterinary care. So they're not gonna be able to get the health care that's needed to keep them thriving in their homes. Veterinarians are also faced with working long hours, strenuous hours, they have a high student debt load compared to the amount of income they have when you're looking at it from the perspective of other healthcare professionals. They focus, oh, I apologize, they see a lot of trauma. So that could be either uh, real traumas like hit by cars, sick animals, neglect or there's trauma when it comes from the client's perspective. So we have to look at individuals that come to practices as a package deal. We have to work and serve the client as well as serve the patients. So clients are coming in with trauma. It could be financial restrictions, um, other challenges that they're having at home. Sometimes they bring those stressors into the clinics and take it out on the professions that are trying to help them. So these are all key factors that are playing into the mental struggle struggles that veterinary professions have. Um, there's a recent study, a, psych, a psychology study done that 80% of veterinarians have been diagnosed with clinical depression, with 50% of them stating that they are unhappy with their career choice and thought they would be better off going in a different direction. AVMA in 2021 did another study that showed that 40% of veterinarians are looking to leave the field completely. So that means not just transitioning from one practice to another or changing from small animal to large animal or research, they're actually looking to exit from veterinary medicine altogether and go into a completely different field where they feel that they would um, have a, a better work-life balance and uh, mental state. There's also been a big transition from a male-dominated field to a female-dominated field. When this happens, we see individuals that want to focus on being more with their families, which is what we would expect. So they're focused on work-life balance. When they have children, they want to spend time with children. There's extracurriculars involved, school schedules involved. So weekends come off the table, nights come off the table, on calls come off the table, and some of them are, are transitioning to either stop practice during that time when their children are young before school, 
or they're looking to go part-time or dra dramatically reduce their hours. Then we have supply and demand. So right now what we're seeing for client-based roles, so these are the ones in practice seeing clients and patients, for every 20 open positions that are posted, there's one licensed veterinarian available to fill that role. So we also have to take that a little bit with a grain of salt that this number may be worse than what we think it is because there are individuals who are retired as well as no longer practicing veterinary medicine or in veterinary medicine. Um, also individuals that have licenses in multiple states so that they can practice in multiple states um, that aren't available to take these roles. Um, so that number is a little bit skewed. There are 32 accredited uh, veterinary colleges in the United States and Canada. These schools have gone through accreditation with the AVMA, and these are the only schools where their graduates are able to sit for the NAVLI, which is the veterinary board, in order to obtain licensure in the United States. These college class sizes average about 125 people. And when I mean class sizes, I mean graduating class. So the year of 2024 is only going to have 125 individuals out of UC Davis, et cetera, like that. In comparison to human medicine, where their class sizes are 800 plus, and there are many more schools available for human medic medical professionals to get into. There are about 17 international colleges that have earned accreditation. So these are for individuals who maybe live in those countries. If they graduate from that school and move to the United States, they can obtain licensure here. Or for US citizens who want to study abroad, they can study at one of these schools and come back to the United States and can earn licensure. If an individual goes to a veterinary program that isn't accredited, even if they graduate, they can't sit for their boards and they can't earn licensure to practice. So even though they have the knowledge, they're unable to see patients. Right now, there are 11 universities that have started the process to look at creating a veterinary college at their university in the United States, which is amazing. We need it. We need that growth. The only challenge is it takes anywhere from five to seven years for that accreditation process to come to fruition. So we're not looking, we're not gonna see the fruits of that labor till the next decade when those individuals graduating are able to sit for their boards. Although we see enrollment up approximately 5%, what we need today to meet the demand of the shortage is at least 20% and we're nowhere near that. We also have the amount of trained veterinarians in the field available to work is stagnant, but we're seeing the growth of pet ownership. 66% of veterinary, oh, excuse me, 66% of households in the United States report that they have pets, and it doesn't account for how many households have multiple pets, which then means that that veterinarian in that community needs to see far more animals than they're able to fit within their workday. So pet ownership has grown approximately 20% within the last 30 years, while the amount of graduates has not. Now that we've talked a little bit of kind of foundational challenges, I want to talk about some of the things that East Bay SPCA is really looking at and honing on and adjusting as we acquire and retain veterinarians. So there have been major shifts in compensation of veterinarians. So prior to COVID, individuals with a base salary between 110 and 120,000 was realistic. And what I mean by base salary is in the profit setting, Doctors will have a, a base of a certain amount, and then what they can earn is production. 
So they can earn a percentage off of every invoice or certain items that, and services that they sell that can increase their earning potential. Um, as of a couple of years ago, that average was about 22%. So you can imagine that that can really impact and increase the amount of revenue, I apologize, the amount of income that they're bringing in. Experienced veterinarians are looking between the 130 to 200,000 range. In the Bay Area, we're definitely in that upper range of what experienced veterinarians are looking at as a base salary. Now, this is looking specifically at general practitioners, which is what we offer at the Theodore B. Travers Veterinary Clinic. Those are the type of services that we do. Now, when you look at specialists, so cardiologists, oncologists, internal medicine, et cetera, and emergency practitioners, their earning potential is much higher. So it is more challenging to bring those type of individuals into a general practice setting. Part-time associates are going to earn more when you break it down hourly because they're not receiving as many benefits. So that is definitely a realistic thing that we're seeing. Then we come into relief veterinarians that has really be, been trending upwards. So these are individuals who are not working for a specific practice or company. They're self-employed. They will then work at multiple different practices, picking up shifts. So it can be seeing appointments, doing surgeries, et cetera. Um, some of them will only work a couple hours. Some will pick up full shifts. Um, they can make their own schedule. They have their own unique demands. And what we're seeing, an average for an eight to 10 hour shift is between $1,500 and $2,000. Um, so they definitely are bringing in the most income. Uh, in 2023, there was a survey indicating that veterinarians are wanting to decrease the amount of hours they work by approximately 7%, an average of 7%, while they're still wanting an increase in their base salary of at least 4%. So we are seeing those trends in compensation packages. And here we're getting creative of how we can compete with some of those for-profit models by having excuse me, base salaries for our veterinarians. But of course, the, the production portion doesn't make sense for what we do. So we're looking at retention bonuses um, to try to match some of those salaries. Now I wanna talk about our benefits packages. The BHMA, which is the Veterinary Hospital Managers Association, they do annual surveys across the United States and Canada that collects information from practices about what they're offering to individuals as benefit packages. I know there's a lot of information on this slide, um, but if you take a quick glance over, everything that has a star next to it is what East Bay SPCA offers. And some of the things that we offer is actually above and beyond what the average percentage of what the majority of practices are offering, such as our medical benefits, um, the amount of discounts that we offer to our team members for veterinary care and other services from um, programs. So we really want to make this a place that people want to work and make them feel that we value them by what we're offering within their compensation packages. One thing that I really want to highlight is the loan forgiveness, so student loan forgiveness. In the nonprofit and government sectors, for individuals who work at those organizations, if they work there for a minimum of 10 years, as well as regularly paid on their student loans without um, being late or in deferment, once they've hit that 10 year mark, whatever is left on their student loans is forgiven by the government. So that takes a large financial burden off of veterinarians' chests, as well as any individual that works in a nonprofit or government agency, they don't have to be a veterinarian or have certain licensure. So it's definitely open to anyone. Um, so that's a really big benefit that we can offer that no corporate or privately owned practice can. We've made many adjustments here at East Bay SPCA to 
retain and acquire veterinarians. The first one I want to go over is focusing on balance. So previously, our veterinarians worked five days a week, approximately eight hour days, and we've transitioned them to a four day work week with 10 hour days, which gives them an extra day during the week for self care, whatever helps bring them fulfillment. It makes it more competitive for uh, flexible work weeks that we're seeing in the veterinary community. At this point, it's almost unheard of for a veterinarian to work five days a week. Most are transitioning to a three to four day work week. Previously, we had 15 minute appointments, which was a really high volume, fast paced appointment schedule. We transitioned to a 20 minute appointment schedule to help find a happy medium because what we're seeing in the field is that most places do a minimum of a 30 minute appointment. The reason for this is studies are showing that the more time you spend with a client, the more they're gonna spend on their pet and the higher that um, average transaction is going to be. And a for-profit model makes complete sense. In a nonprofit model where we're focused on working with the community that has financial and socioeconomic challenges, we need to find a balance because the more time we spend on them doesn't mean they're going to have those finances to increase the revenue that we're bringing in to help fund our programming. So that 20 minute appointment is that happy medium where veterinarians feel that they can educate and rely on their support team to work with patients, um, as well as seeing as many patients as possible to help the community. We brought in our humane advocacy professionals, so our social workers, they come in and really support our veterinarians and our team. They work with individuals that have a lot of um, challenges in their life, whether it be their finances or housing. Um, so a lot of the stressors that sometimes impact what type of services we can provide to the pets. So what this means is that our veterinarians can create treatment plans that are appropriate to the lifestyle and the ailment that the patient is presenting for, while the social workers are working with that client to make it realistic for them to do, as well as help fund them so that they're not faced with that financial burden so that we're taking care of the animal. We've expanded our pool of candidates. So previously, we wanted to focus mainly on experienced hires. The reason for this is those veterinarians had the knowledge and the skill to come in, hit the ground running, see as many patients as possible, do those surgeries that needed to be done that clients couldn't afford at the outside practices, and we've transitioned to allowing one new graduate on our team at a time. So we can focus our mentorship on one individual and giving them the resources to really grow and hone their skills so that in the shortest time possible, we can get them up to speed with really helping the community. We've done passive recruitment. So we have three veterinary specific recruiters on retention. They focus on the entire United States. Now that we can do some visas, which I can get to in just a second, um, I've asked them to do international work as well. They have a much larger network than I have that I can do solely, although I feel like I focus most of my time on recruitment because this is just such a huge part of us being able to meet our mission is we need these professionals in our clinics. Then uh, the visas. So as of last year, we are now registered to sponsor HB1 visas. So international individuals who can obtain a license in the state of California, if they wanna work here, but they're not citizens, we will sponsor their work visas so that they can be here with us. Um, not a lot of people have that option, so it definitely did open the door to some candidates. We're also increasing the access to care that we offer. So there's two spots when it comes to the in-person aspect of practice. In 2024, legislation was passed to allow us to establish a veterinary client-patient relationship, which is required to um, prescribe or diagnose a patient. 
So we can now do that over telemedicine. So that is another way to relieve some of that burden for more appointments to come in, as well as patients to be seen without taking up the in-person appointments that really have to come in. And then there's also been legislation that's expanded the scope of practice for RBTs. So there's more that they can legally do that originally required veterinarians. So it opens up veterinarians to be able to do things that they can only legally do. We also used to only hire RVTs when we had open positions for that specific role. RVTs are licensed, they go through a board exam, um, they have specialized skills, and there's things that they legally can only do that veterinary assistants can only do. We have now sponsored our veterinary assistants to pursue that education and sit for their boards to become RVTs. In the last year and a half, we've sponsored eight individuals through that education, and many have passed their boards to obtain their RVTs. So this really supports our veterinarians with the knowledge and the skills and prevents us from having to decrease any type of services because we don't have someone legal, legally able to provide that service. Then there's the in-house care when it comes to our humane advocacy program. Previously, our grant funding was utilized for our Theodore B. Travers Family Clinic, as well as our spay neuter clinics. Now that we have such a shortage, we know that there are more people in the community that need our assistance than we're able to get in to appointments here. So our amazing HA team has created relationships with multiple practices in the Bay Area, and we will fund their veterinary care at their practice, um, and it helps keep with continuity of care as well. So that's another way to decrease that burden off our veterinarians where they feel that they're doing a disservice by not being able to get these people into the clinic that really need our assistance. Our current pipeline where it stands today I have one candidate that is very interested in joining our team. We have been what I would consider a courtship when it comes to veterinarians and the hiring process. Uh, they're coming in for working interviews. We do regular check-ins. Um, it can be scary for a veterinarian to leave where they're at and join a new practice. It's a lot of change involved. They want to make sure that they can work independently and practice the medicine that they're passionate about. Um, so I completely support them in their decision making process. It isn't unheard of for me to start a conversation and then six months later, it take that long for them to actually sign an offer letter. Um, so I keep a pulse on the candidates that I'm working with very closely and um, help support them through their entire decision making process. We have a new graduate that's joining our team on June 10th. I can't tell you how excited I am for this new graduate to be joining our team. She is a Bay Area native. She is passionate about, passionate about community medicine and the community that we serve. Um, she is going to be graduating from Arizona this in May, and then she's going to be joining the team, and we are really going to focus on mentoring her and getting her up to speed. And lastly, we do have a veterinarian who has dedicated themselves to launching our telemedicine program. We're going to be launching this next month, so stay tuned for that. We're going to be focusing mainly on behavior cases to get started and make sure that we work kind of the uh, logistical and technological kinks out of it before we expand the services that we offer. Uh, so again, we're really excited about this, and I look forward to this pipeline growing. So that concludes my presentation today, and I'd like to kick it off to Julie and Allison for any questions that individuals may have. Thanks, Kristen. That was great, very informative. Um, so as we mentioned at the beginning, um, if you have any questions, they're encouraged. Um, there's a Q&A section down at the bottom of your screen um, where you can type in questions. Um, so feel free to put those in and we will get to them as soon as we are able. Um, let's start here. Um, 
Sorry, I'm having a little technical difficulty with my chat. Apologies. Here we go. Okay, what is being done to combat the veterinary shortage? So as I mentioned, definitely schools are looking, universities are looking to expand with veterinary colleges. There are also some talks when it comes to creating a mid-level professional, like you would see a nurse practitioner. Um, there has been lots of discussion about creating a mid-level for registered veterinary technicians. There hasn't been a title created. There isn't any um, there is a curriculum, but it hasn't been accredited. Um, there's lots of legislation that goes into that. There are many veterinarians that are in support of this, but again, it is a process when it comes to creating new licensure, changing laws, on um, what is in the scope of practice of certain individuals. There's also different legislations that we're looking at and people are proposing. So the first one again was RBTs growing their scope of practice. Another one that is on the floor for California right now is for RBTs to be able to do some more procedural type work that would be minor procedures that you would see like an RN doing um, that an RBT would be able to support the veterinarian to uh, free up their time. So there's things of getting creative because we know we're not going to be able to produce more veterinarians in this very moment, um, but it's more about expanding their support and trying to adjust how we run practices to get the most amount of patients seen. Okay, great. And then Allison, I think this one's for you. How many total staff members does East Bay SBCA currently have? I think we are currently at about 75. Um, when we get fully staffed again in our full service clinic, um, that number will obviously climb. And as Kristen alluded to, we are working towards that. We are very excited that we've got some great folks that are coming on board and in the pipeline. We really look forward to being able to do more. And particularly with our humane advocacy program, um, you know, Kristen didn't touch uh, on this specifically, but, you know, one of the bottlenecks has been our, with our humane advocates, um, we, on any given day, they have about a hundred open cases. That is a lot of people. These cases are referred to us from uh, smaller rescue groups who work with homeless folks, um, caseworkers working with people dealing with medical crises, domestic violence challenges and so forth. And, you know, they ask that we provide care for their animals. Um, of, of course, this includes people and pets facing medical emergencies for their animals. So uh, the more staff we get, the more we can do. But in the interim, we have great partnerships with private practices and we have a memorandums of understanding with these groups so we can hopefully get these pets in to be seen as quickly as possible. If someone is interested in transitioning to a second career with animals, what is the best career path given the late timing to go back to vet school? Well, that's a good one. <laughs> um, so if they are looking to get into vet school, there are definitely a, a couple of avenues. So many vet schools don't require you to have a previous degree. It's extremely competitive to get into vet school though. So having a degree does make it um, more attainable. The uh, different vet schools have different prerequisites. So if you're interested in certain vet schools, you would need to look at what their specific prerequisites are and you can go to classes specifically for those prereqs. Um, there's also an expiration on how long those prereqs last. So if it's been 10 years since you've been out of school, unfortunately, you need to take the classes again. Um, they want to see well-rounded individuals. So whether it's um, volunteering, so lots of opportunities with nonprofits, um, getting jobs within the field, um, research. I mean, there's definitely different ways to do it. We've actually have um, our shelter vet, Dr. Josie Noah, she was actually a high school math teacher and started volunteering with 
of Bay Area nonprofit that went into communities to serve the unsheltered population and fell in love with vet med, took her prereqs, and then went to UC Davis for vet school. Um, we also have another individual that does relief work. She was previously a lawyer and she did her prereqs and then applied to go to vet school and she got into UC Davis. So there are many different avenues. Um, I say don't do, be discouraged if you don't get in the first time, if it's a passion you really want to do, um, because it does take individuals sometimes multiple times, rounds to get into vet school. As a follow-up to that question, question, Christian, um, tell me a little bit about if someone feels like vet school at this point is not right for them, what other options are there that could help this shortage? Like what's the process for becoming an RVT and, and any kind of support services staff that can help with veterinary care? Yeah, definitely. That's a really excellent and exciting question. Uh, vet school is a long process and challenging. So other ways to support are great. So there are different avenues to obtain your RVT license. There are schools that are completely online. So one of them is called Penn Foster, which is accredited. So you can take those courses and be able to sit for your boards. Um, and it's self-paced. So you can do it as fast as you want. You can take time as long as you want. Um, and then lots of places you can volunteer to get experience. Some people will get jobs in a clinic, sometimes starting as a CSR, so um, our front desk, a VA. There's also practices that have what we call kennel staff, so they support the entire practice. So they do a lot of handling animals, cleaning, so it's a way to get yeah, kind of your foot in the door. Um, other avenues, working with animals. Um, if you're already in the field as a veterinary assistant, you can do the accelerated route, which is about a five month program. There's online programs for that. And there's also um, in person schools. You can earn your associates, which is a two year program. Uh, so lots of different avenues for that. Right. And we and are actually funding um, our vet assistants to go through the accelerated RVT program. Someone mentioned about um, a fund for individuals donating for loan forgiveness. We don't have that specifically, but what we have been very grateful for are some donors coming forward and helping us fund these um, experienced vet assistants to go through the accelerated RVT program. And we are thrilled that most, I think, um, I don't know, Kristen can answer, I think all of our VAs are going through it right now and will become registered vet techs. Yep, every single veterinary assistant on our team has either completed the program, in the program, or just starting the program. So as any VAs come on board, it's something I'm really excited to offer them for professional um, advancement. So this is a good follow-up question to that, Allison. Uh, do you have a fund at East Bay SBCA that individuals can donate to to support loan forgiveness? Not specifically, but we have been very grateful for the support of donors who are funding our uh, accelerated RBT program. And so we have been using those funds to cover that cost in total, 100%, so we can get these vet assistants registered as vet techs. So in the presentation, you mentioned that for every 20 veterinarian or for every veterinarian coming out of school, there were 20 jobs available. How big um, and what area does that cover when you're talking about uh, geographically um, that statistic? That covers the entire United States. Um, there are areas that it can be more challenging. Uh, depending on the demographic and geographic area that individuals are interested in. So there are some government funds for very rural communities for large animal veterinarians. Um, sometimes there's a shortage there where there's miles and miles and miles without any veterinarians at all. Um, and then even some of the urban areas like us, there are a lot of postings and then not as many individuals living in that area or interested to relocate to that area. Um, so it, it does depend on where you're at, what the exact ratio is, but overarching in the United States, it's about 20 to one. What veterinarians leaving the field, what type of, with veterinarians leaving the field, what type of people thrive at East Bay SBCA? So, 
To really thrive here, what we are looking for are individuals who are mission driven and passionate about helping people and their pets. So we are kind of boots on the ground. It's really rewarding when you see a, a individual come in that really had nowhere else to turn and you can help make them feel comfortable for one, building trust with that individual. Maybe they haven't had good experience with veterinarians. Maybe it's prolonged the care that their pet has needed. Um, we also are looking for individuals that thrive thinking outside the box. So if an individual is looking at gold standard high tower medicine, they may not thrive in our clinic setting. We do practice amazing high quality medicine. So don't take that as we're cutting corners. Um, we do have our AHA accreditation, which means that we are practicing the highest caliber of medicine possible. But what that means is we're meeting people where they're at. So say a dog comes in that's hit by a car and his leg is shattered or is could po potentially have pins in place and go through a whole orthopedic procedure. The, our clients can't do that, and the best plan of action would be an amputation to give an excellent quality of life and get them reunited with their parent to live their lives fully. So it's kind of adjusting and thinking outside the box of what maybe the universities would want you to do versus what's realistic for our community. How can volunteers help with this challenge? Ooh, that's lots of... Uh, well, if you know anybody who's a veterinarian and is interested, send them my way. <laughs> I'm happy to chat with anybody. Um, but coming into the clinics, um, there's lots of different volunteer opportunities if you're looking to come in. Also, I definitely think chatting with individuals that have maybe have challenging thoughts or a look on veterinarians. If someone's starting to have that conversation with you, I hope that you feel empowered and you're kind of have a base of education or can reference them to reach out um, and kind of learn more about what the shortage is and help individuals understand what pressures the veterinary profession is under. Does the clinic or anyone at East Bay SPCA go out into the community to help the pets of homeless people? We actually partner with individual organizations that go directly into the communities. So um, our HA Humane Advocacy Program is really dedicated to that. They have really open communication. Um, we will help them with supplies. They'll refer cases to us. We'll help fund them at other clinics if they can't get into our clinic. So it's a really close connection. Uh, what we noticed is that it made the most sense for our mission for our veterinarians to be in house with all the supplies that they need in order to help the pets and those organizations that are going into the community or the unsheltered um, groups, they can transport those animals to us or if it's certain supplies that can legally be distributed out in the community, we'll help them with that as well. How does the work of East Bay SBCA's humane advocacy staff differ uh, from social workers who work in the mental health field? Ooh. Um, I personally am not 100% confident on speaking exactly how human social workers operate. I know there are some things that overlap. Um, there is even a school in Tennessee that will take on individuals that have uh, masters in social work and help them become veterinary social workers. So I can mainly speak to veterinary social workers. Um, there's a lot of the financial component, but they are do provide wraparound case management. So they are collaborating with a lot of uh, human specific human services social workers so um, housing uh, food challenges so you know with human food banks we'll partner with them to provide pet food um, we use you know case management software checking in follow-ups um, there's also the financial component of obtaining grants to fund care for people 
I, again, am unsure of the uh, scope of practice for human social workers if that is within their wheelhouse. Allison, I'm not sure if you had anything to add on that one. I was just going to add that um, our humane advocates have, a, obviously, it's a very heavy um, human component, obviously. I mean, they're dealing with an animal in crisis, but frequently it's a person in crisis as well. And as Kristen touched upon, um, they make sure that the person also has wraparound care and that we have their caseworker contact information so that we can track them down, work with them, follow up with them, and make sure that they're getting, and their pet is getting the care that they need. So Kristen, what are veterinary recruiters noticing when they speak to candidates? So the ones that I work with specifically, um, I touch base with them on a, a regular intervals. Our last meeting that I had, they stated that our, our compensation is competitive, our benefits are right in line or above line. So what they're seeing is it's all about the individual, whether they what they're passionate about, because veterinarians right now, I mean, they're the ones that are choosing where they're going. Um, so we they're looking for someone that is specific on um, community medicine, mission driven. And then unfortunately, there have been a lot of media about the Oakland area. Um, so some individuals that are not familiar with the Bay Area may have hesitations of even opening a conversation about coming to the community, even though we're surrounded by so many amazing things, um, a lot of lifestyle where you can be a foodie, you can be a hiker, you can be beach. I mean, there are amazing things here. There's just a lot in the media that kind of scares people away. Um, since COVID, there has been a lot of transition from individuals wanting to be in urban areas to more of a suburban lifestyle. Um, so that's one of one of the main challenges that we're facing with our recruiters is their interest in coming to the Oakland area. Do you see less experienced veterinarians or recent graduates being more interested in working at shelters versus ones with private practice experience? Yeah, um, we do see individuals specifically interested in shelter medicine. There was a boom that I specifically noticed post-COVID with a lot of my applicants uh, because they didn't want to work with clients um, because there were so many stressors involved with those communications and the, it was hard on everybody. So they were looking to alleviate that portion from their practice while still being able to um, health animals. So when we're looking for filling our role specifically, we're looking for associate vets for our Theodore B. Travers Family Clinic, which is a client-based practice. Um, so we are looking for individuals wanting to work with clients. Um, so I do see an increase in some of those um, mainly experience. New grads do have an interest and a lot of new grads come out wanting to do all of it. They want to do the shelter med, they want to see patients, they want to um, do high volume spay and neuter. So we're having transitions a little bit about focusing um, what they're looking for. How many more veterinarians is East Bay SBCA looking to add to the team? I would like to take minimum two more, um, but I am not closing the door on anyone interested in joining our team and growing our program. The need to see patients and clients in our community as costs get higher and the availability for appointments decreases, um, I think we can definitely fill that need with as many people that are open to coming. Here's a more specific question. Um, how does the AVMA support development for veterinary assistance? The support of the programs would be based on their accreditation process um, to make those individuals eligible to sit for their boards. Um, they definitely 
want to have more RVTs in the field and grow. So there's no hangups on veterinary assistants becoming RVTs or going through programs. Um, but there isn't any that I've seen specifically any certain AVMA like uh, sponsorships or scholarships that I've noticed um, to help fund veterinary assistants to grow that program. Okay, um, that was all the questions we had in Q and A. Um, Kristen or Allison, any final thoughts before we wrap up today? Um, I just see one more question that just came in um, asking, is it financially helpful for us if people who can afford um, to pay for our services come get services from us? Yes, absolutely. We provide really excellent veterinary care and um, we welcome anyone to come use our services. And yes, the people that are able to pull full price absolutely help us fund um, our ability to help people who need assistance. Okay, well, uh, just a reminder, we did record this session and we will be sharing it in the follow up email, but we want to thank you all for joining us today. Um, the work that we do in the community is possible because of supporters like you. If you're ever interested in learning more about volunteering or donating, please don't hesitate to reach out. We would love to hear from you. We love being a part of this community and we appreciate